My name is Jacqueline Keeler, and I'm a, um, a journalist and a writer, and, uh, and I am a Native American, and uh, uh, my tribe is the Navajo, I'm enrolled in the Navajo Nation, I'm a citizen of the Navajo Nation, and my father is Yankton Sioux, another tribe in South Dakota. And, uh, and so, uh, you know, um, a few years back, I was involved with Island of Lore in Portland, and we got involved with organizing this thing called Not Your Mascot. We created this hashtag, it was created here in Portland, <laughs> in case people don't know that. And, uh, you know, and we trended it nationally um, in, during the Super Bowl of 2014. And, uh, and so, one of the few, I don't think many native hashtags have trended nationally, so it was kind of a special thing for our community. And, uh, and we were basically trying to put an end to the use of native people as mascots. You know, just to stop the mascotting. And so, uh, and that's how I think we first kind of met over Twitter. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, and, uh, and so, um, uh, so we, uh, you know, he was actually being attacked a lot by uh, native folks on Twitter, by native Twitter, right? Pretty much, and and so um, and so then, you know, we we found out that we both lived here in Portland, and so we agreed to meet. And uh, and the concern was that uh, the way, um, so uh, the very, uh, I don't know if many of you are familiar with the origins of the lawsuit that was done against the Washington NFL team um, for their their mascot. Um, uh, Suzanne Harjo, who is an elder, she is uh, from the Scobie Creek tribe. Uh, she basically um, started this um, this lawsuit back in the early 1990s or late 80s, actually. And the first time they did the lawsuit, they got a, a bunch of native people together and they filed a lawsuit um, under the the Lanham Act, right? Yeah. Yeah. And basically, it's this. I, I don't know. It's this old law from like the 1930s. Uh, 1942. 1940. Yeah. yeah. And uh, and they basically, um, you know, they, they kind of were, they kind of saw a way they could use it to try to get rid of this mascot, trying to get rid of the, the use of, of of the term Redskins, which is pretty uh, abhorrent to have as the team in our in our in this country's capital, right? Uh, because the Redskin name refers to basically uh, the bounties that were paid for our scalps. Because they were bloody, you know, and so uh, so it it, revol it goes back to a really horrible history in America, and to use that as the name for the national team is pretty important, you know, and so they thought they had found this sort of way that they've been fighting this issue. She's been involved in it since the late '60s, early '70s, and so in the in the late '80s, they were like they found this law. They're like, hey, maybe we could do it this way. And so they did their first case. Um, my, my grandma's cousin was one of the uh, plaintiffs, uh, Vine Deloria Jr. He's a uh, Standing Rock Sioux historian and writer. He wrote, you can find his books in here too. And uh, he wrote a book called Custer Died for Your Sins, which is kind of the handbook for the Red Power Movement in the late 60s, early 70s. And, um, and so he was one of the plaintiffs. And, um, and so they did it and they lost because of a technicality. Um, one of the folks who was um, one of the plaintiffs, he was too young to have filed or something like that. And so she refiled again with a new group, um, and, uh, um, and it was, um, I think the, the first plaintiff's name was Amanda Blackhorse, so it's called the Blackhorse case. And uh, they just put the plaintiff's alphabetical order, B came first. And so, uh, so, so, yeah, so they felt that his case, going to the Supreme Court, was going to ruin their chances of winning this case. And so, uh, and they've been working on this for so long, they were particularly upset about it. And, and but after I, I met with Simon and I talked to him and I learned more about the law, I had to really question the actual ethics of the, um, the strategy, you know? I hadn't realized the, the, the way in which it was being used against other, um, other um, minority groups and, and underrepresented folks. Um, and, and after I learned that, I. I kind of it changed my relationship to to what I what, what I thought we were doing, you know. Well, I think it, it, so. To, to kind of clarify um, about how the law was being used, the the, yeah, the same provision of the Lanham Act is what was barring our band from being able to register our band name, the Slants, because they said it was inappropriate for for Asian people to call themselves the Slants. Um, and we found out there was actually a pattern to this because if you think about like who are the kinds of people that reappropriate language? What well, tends to be people of color and members of the LGBTQ community, 
And so what ended up happening was like whenever members of these communities would reappropriate words, the governments would say it's inappropriate, it's uh, it, it's not okay. But whenever people outside of those community groups tried to register those same exact words, it was okay. So like you know. Every single racial slur you could think of for an Asian American has been registered many, many times. You know, as, as a as a Chinese American, uh, the probably the most devastating term for me is the is the word chink. Well, that was registered eight times. The only time it was ever rejected under this law was when an Asian American activist named Randall Liu out of Atlanta created T-shirts that said "Chink Proud." All of a sudden, the government was cracking down on him. And so it, it had what we call um, disparate impact, like when a law you know, impacts more of one group than, than another group. And that's, a, that's one of the reasons I, why we kind of continue to challenge that. Um, and all, all along the while, I mean, the, the Black Horse case was certainly on my mind because I, I'm not a, I don't support the use of human beings as, as mascots either. Um, but, but I also realized that the, you, you know, when we came to the laws, we had to kind of think about like, what does justice look like? Is it about just punishing those who, who take advantage of our laws? Um, who are kind of getting away with it all the time, or is it providing more options to those who have the fewest options and fewest resources in our society? And, and I think that's kind of like what kind of got the conversation going, is like, well, we, we, we learned we didn't have different values. We just had different like legal strategies on how to achieve those values in, in, in a society that was not meant for, for people like us. <laughs> uh, and if you really think about it, like the government could say all day long how much they were trying to use this, um, this law to protect minorities, but the reality is it was written in 1942, and in, the, in the middle of the Jim Crow era. It, they were, despite them saying, like, oh, we're protecting you against racism, they continued to defend groups like the KKK and Stormfront and other major white supremacist groups. In fact, they still defend the KKK, calling them a notable historical society. So this law wasn't doing anything to protect our communities. It was actually suppressing our speech. Yeah, and I, and I hadn't, I first heard of the strategy that um, Suzanne used when she came. I was a student at Dartmouth College and um, an undergraduate, and she came, she was a Montgomery fellow. And so she told us about what they were doing at the time. Um, this was for the first case they filed in the early 90s. And, uh, and we thought, and, and she knew even then that it was sort of a, a bad act, like it was, it had aspects to it which were unsavory, you know, but they sort of saw it as a quick and dirty way to resolve the situation with this one case, with, with the use of, of term red skins. And, and, uh, and, you know, as a young person, I was like, okay. And, um, but then when I spoke to you, I realized it just made me feel that, you know, we, we, if we're gonna win, really win, we have to do it in solidarity with other groups, you know, not to criticize with I mean, I, I, I really respect Suzanne and, and yeah, all the work that they, that all the folks who put their lives, I mean, they were really harassed and put themselves out there to be um, named in this um, lawsuit. Um, and, but, um, but I, I had to think, you know, and sometimes we have to, we, first of all, we have to talk to each other, different groups. I mean, that was really, Quite um, eye-opening to me. I hadn't realized the ways in which the law was being used so selectively, and and really to to silence mostly um, people of color and LGBTQ people. Um, I had no idea, and, and certainly the native community did not know. And so after I spoke to Simon, we did we did an interview, and and I, I published in, in Indian Country Today, and uh, and they uh, were very generous. They gave us lots of space. They even uh, reprinted the entire conversation. Yeah. <laughs> Three hour conversation. Yeah, they like, did the whole transcript plus an article, and um, I, wrote, I wrote the article, and and um, and they um, were and they were very interested too in some of the background you had. You had more some interesting knowledge about even the loss, the Black Horse lawsuit, of how it was being sort of manipulated um, behind the scenes with players in the court system, and and um, and, you know, and so it, it was very. It was actually um, you know even the um, the attorneys for the Black Horse case were very interested in reading. The transcript of what the insight that you provided to the case as well. Yeah, but I, I think that like one of the things the these kind of parallel journeys also shows is that like there's no doubt that good was created from Harjo and the Black Horse cases because it raised the profile, it raised the issue to a level that most Americans were not even thinking about, and so I think it was really really important for that and. 
and sometimes like even if our activist strategies don't ultimately pan out, we can we can certainly pivot and still celebrate the, the good that had come as a result of that. And I think it was because they uh, raised the issue because you know of the the not your mascot trend and 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 getting allies on board to like talk about the issue more. You know, in the last few years, we've seen more Native American mascots being removed from schools, colleges, high schools. Uh, you know, either even retiring Chief Wahoo to a certain degree um, than ever before, and and that actually began not necessarily with like um, cancellations of IP. But it began with community conversations when you when you actually connect with folks and say like this is how it affects our dignity as a people this is how it affects our children because uh, no doubt it, it it's a severe mental trauma it creates all these issues and so um, you know I, I I'm like it, even if it didn't ultimately the case didn't ultimately win um, it still did a whole lot of good and and I, and I was certainly grateful for that I mean like. Um, you know, Asian Americans also have experienced this issue as well. There are many high schools and colleges with uh, Chinese people as mascots, like, um, you know, over racial stereotypes, and they call those teams the Orientals. Most of those teams have flipped now, and, you know, they're calling them, like, the Dragons or something like that. But, you, you know, like, it's like we can at least understand to some degree and, 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 and allows us to kind of build connection, community, and empathy around that. Yeah, the, um, the, when I spoke to the attorneys for the Black Forest case, they did tell me, and, and Sudan did tell me as well, that one of the things they really are proud of, um, and some of the plaintiffs told me that they are really proud that they got the they got the judge on the record to declare that the term was racist, and so they have that legal record. Um, but and, and yeah, I mean the the issue of masketry, um, it's it's um. I think people don't realize the kind of studies that have been done to show the impact that it has on Native youth. Uh, it's, um, you know, uh, Dr. Um, uh, Fry, Stephanie Freiberg, uh, she's a TULIP tribal member, and, and when she was at Stanford, she did a lot of research and found that uh, Native youth that were exposed to mascots, Native mascots, um, that they um, had, um, it, it lowered their self-esteem after they were exposed to it. And she actually found that Native Native students that she had tested, who said they were fine with mascots, actually experienced a steeper decline after they were exposed to Native mascots. Because there's a certain level of emotional compensation that has to go on to make it okay. you know. And they don't even realize to the extent to which they're devoting so much of their energy to do that. Energy they could be using for other things. you know. And you know, Native mascots in high schools around this country you know, they estimate there is about, there are about 2,000 high schools that have native mascots. And if you were to extrapolate that number to, let's say, the black community, uh, you would be, and they're about 10 times the size population-wise as, as, as we are, you know, you'd be looking at 20,000 high schools in this country that would have black mascots. And and all the, the sort of, what that would entail for, um, for families and, and students to have to do to, Educate or deal with their classmates to to make to to to, <laughs> to clear up a lot of the the, uh, the negative stereotypes that brings out. And, and the University of Buffalo did a study where they found that uh, that uh, native masketry is sort of like an entry drop entry level drug for hatred. Um, you know uh, that uh, when people are exposed to native masketry, then it then leads to them to have um, more negative stereotypes about other people too. And it's it's just. Uh, it's something that we um, we just set as a country, uh, if we're going to be genuinely pluralistic, that we have to put it into. Um, we can't be teaching children that because we're extending that to the end of the century, um, those ideas. Yeah. Yeah. Is there a particular section you want to? Um, well, I don't know. I um, how the wicked live. That looks really good. <laughs> so, um, well, well, actually, I wanted to ask you. You so. So why did you feel the need to include that in your book, that our conversation that we had? Uh, it, it, it was really important to me because I, I think our, the first time we met, uh, I wasn't really sure like what your intentions were. I wasn't sure like, like when you only talk on Twitter, <laughs> it, it, it's, it's tough. It, it's tough and I wasn't sure what the, uh, the reaction was going to be like. But um, on the day, that, that we won the, the Supreme Court case, uh, I actually had a lot of conflicted feelings because um, 
it, it would I you know it was it should have been like this major celebration eight years of, of fighting against the government finally done but everywhere I turned in terms of TV uh, radio uh, the news headlines um, all they talked about was the Washington football team like they talked about how they just won a major Supreme Court case and I was like they weren't even in the courtroom that had nothing to do with them um, and even when they talked about our band there were pictures of football helmets and it was like really tough because I was you know for many years I was trying to articulate that there are differences there are differences between the cases and um, and, and so like I, we, we actually connected a few days after that we, we met up for some tea and it just we, when you kind of demonstrate like empathy and compassion like and I was like all these mixed feelings it, it had just meant so much to me like I, I, I don't know if I ever really expressed that but it, 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 it was like I, I, I really really appreciated that and, and there were a lot of folks um, who were understandably upset who perhaps you know, just read the headlines and didn't really understand all the, the, the legal nuances and things like that. And and you actually, um, a few days after we met, you, you went on the radio and actually defended me. And I just, um, I don't know, it just meant, meant a lot. Yeah, I think, um, you know, uh, um, there were, it's, we, there's so many ways in which we're all approaching white supremacy from different parts different seats at the table, you know, and often we're not able to relate to each other, we have to relate across the um, social structure of white supremacy, of which this country is built on, the fundamental part of the origin story of this country. And um, I, I have a book coming out, um, I'm a journalist, so in 2016 I covered, I started, I started out in January covering the occupation of Mount here by the Bundys, and then I ended up in December uh, you know, covering uh, the uh, the standoff at Standing Rock, and um, and so it was you know both in the winter two camps, and um, and so I really think a lot about um, sort of what what we're all dealing with in this country now politically. You know, um, these sort of historical origin stories, um, the origin story of the United States being based in white supremacy. And, um, and how it impacts our lives today. And, um, and the origin story of indigenous people um, who, um, you know, I, I had to come up with a simple definition because so many people know the definition of a colonist, right? We know what colonies do and how they operate, you know, take, occupy someone else's land, take their wealth, export it to the, their 1%, you know, that's a colonist, right? That's a colony and that's what the United States is. And, um, and so, but, Indigenous people, of course, we are our relationships to the land itself. You know, we our origin story is based in um, our meeting with usually a sacred being who is a manifestation of the land from which we get our original instructions and we make an agreement with on how we're going to live. And from that comes everything, how we all the outcomes that we have um, versus the outcomes of colonialism, which is of course climate change, you know, nuclear winter, <laughs> all those sorts of things. They're very different from each other, and I just bring it up to explain that you know we're all we, the things we're dealing with are not individual things in a sense. They're not our fault, right? They are, but we need to understand them, and we need to talk to each other to do so. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I was actually um, on a panel with Amanda Black Horse about a year and a half ago, and it was really interesting because we were each sharing our stories to this room about. about four or five hundred attorneys, like IP attorneys, who were like fascinated by our respective cases. And someone stood up and they had a question and they said, I just, I wish we could live in a world where both Amanda and Simon could win. And, and the irony is that they wouldn't let us respond to it. It was the, the white attorneys who were, you know, she has a white attorney, I have a white attorney. They were all re representing us. They were the ones that answered that question. But I just wanted to say like, if you want a world where both of us can win, then you have to end white supremacy. Like the rules weren't created for us. We have to play with these rules. We have to work with them and, and kind of deconstruct them from inside. Like, it, 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 and it's like kind of funny because like, um, when you think about like my, my band or the Washington football team, um, people get very, very obsessed with like this idea of like racial slurs. And I'm always like thinking like, well, racial slurs are just the symptom. And sometimes we might use them as a tool, but the reality is that 
uh, racial slurs wouldn't exist in our world if it, our world wasn't based on racism, if we didn't have a structure, a system of racism. So, so that's why I try and use it to exploit the system to find ways to actually challenge it and, and to deal with the, the root causes of like institutionalized racism or discrimination and, and cultural racism. Yeah, it makes me, you know, you're talking with your song about, you know, how you wanted to, you know, to the, uh, to the trademark um, office and yeah, stuff like that. And, um, and I was just thinking like, and, and I, I think it really appealed to my son because he, he wants, he, he doesn't want to feel limited by this, by the, by white supremacy. He wants, he, he's at an age where he just wants to do what he wants to do. He doesn't want to feel encumbered by it, you know? And, um, and I think um, and that's really the goal, you know? Um, it's the goal. The goal is not just to end with um, you know addressing aspects of this octopus, right? The goal is to actually be completely free of it. And and I'd like you maybe I to hear how you feel like pursuing this case, what that meant to you, and how having a, taking ownership of, of like a term like slanted, how what exactly that meant to you? You know, for me. Um... It, it comes back to this idea of dignity, like the idea of choosing your identity and kind of owning it. it it's, it's like it, that's tied in with dignity. It's, 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 I believe it's a human right that others shouldn't have the right to define who you are, that you should be able to do that. You should decide your, you know, how you want to be addressed and how you want to be identified. And I, I think for a long time, I couldn't even quite articulate it like that, that way. I didn't really quite understand it until um, a very, a very particular moment, um, and it was not in the Supreme Court, uh, definitely not there, but it was in a moment that happened afterwards. I guess we were walking out of the courtroom, and I was just thinking, like, you know, the court, they don't get it. Like, the, the government just doesn't understand it. Um, as, as we were des descending down the steps of the Supreme Court outside, the, the whole plaza was filled with people, like maybe a couple hundred people, and, and I remember being, like, kind of frustrated. I was like, they don't get it either. Like courts in session, there's there's no tours today. What what are they all doing here? And it wasn't until we were walking halfway down the steps when when the crowd looks up, they they see us, and then they begin cheering for us as we walk down the steps. And then all of a sudden, I was like, I don't understand what's happening. But then these these two Asian kids run up to me, and, and they're like, Simon. Simon, our, our parents let us ditch school to be here today. And of course, I'm like, what kind of Asian parents do you have? <laughs> and they're like, no, no, you don't get it. And they're like, we're from California. We, we flew here and waited all night on that cold sidewalk to be here, but there are too many people. And they explained to me that they were they're freshmen in high school. Um, and so that for their entire lives, ever since they were little kids, they heard about me, they heard about our band's work, and they said, you know, we heard about the one who was willing to fight for the dignity of our community. And that's when I started, like, getting it. It was just, like, this idea that we should have the right to define who we are. We should have a right to decide what's appropriate for our community and not let other people make that decision for us. Uh, because when other people do that, it strips you of your agency. Um, and, and it's funny, because I had been fighting for almost a decade, and I didn't really... I couldn't capture it the same way that these kids did. And it was just, I don't know, it was one of the most powerful moments I had in this journey. And, and they even told me that, you know, when they when they graduated high school, they're gonna go go to college and study public policy development. Mm -hmm. And they said, you know, when we we're done there, we're gonna we're gonna run for office and we're gonna change the system we fought against. And I mean it was then that I finally felt like it really it doesn't matter that much if we win or lose at the Supreme Court. Like what matters is that we win in the hearts and minds of the people affected by the laws because there there are hope for, for actually ultimately dismantling the system. That's beautiful. I love that. That's beautiful. Um, I, uh, so then how did it feel it's then yeah, there is a thing about our communities, right? And I think for native people often sometimes I get questions from, you know, uh, from folks from uh, reservation communities who have native mascots, right? And, and there's still sort of a mixed thing. Some of it is, you know, if they're mascotting themselves, they're affirming their own identity. If they're mascotting another tribe, then they're sort of perpetuating stereotypes, right? 
Um, and uh, but uh, but then when they travel the, these these uh, reservation high schools, they have to play white schools off the reservation, and they get confronted by all this really negative, st these sort of you know trail of tear signs and you know scalp them and all that kind of stuff, you know. And um, and so there's our communities, but then there's how we interact with the dominant society that benefits from white supremacy, right? And, um, and, and you sort of confronted that in your case as well, because you, here you have Dan Snyder, owner of the Washington Redskins, trying to use this for his own benefit, and to turn two, two um, minority groups against each other in the process. Yeah, I mean, one of the kind of weird um, uh, results of the case after we won was like a whole bunch of Washington football team fans started following our pages. And so we just started using our social media accounts to talk about why we should add native mascotry. <laughs> because all of a sudden we had credibility with them in a different kind of way. And we're like, hey, you, if you really believe in freedom of speech, if you really believe in these ideas, well, why not let these other people make those decisions about it as well? And, and let's talk about these stories of why. Like, what would, what would it be like for you if someone like masqueraded your child and treated them like this? And, and, and we're able to reach people in a very different way because they just kind of saw us as this other player that, that wasn't involved in that particular battle. So, um, you know, it, it, I think it just kind of goes also back to this idea that our communities should be intentionally working together because it's like, if we're not, uh, this, this world is very, very eager to just divide and conquer. It's a lot easier for them to deal with us individually as opposed to like working in concert together. Have you ever talked to Dan Snyder? I have not. I so I met two of their attorneys, yeah. and one of them is um, is very orange colored. <laughs> he's, he's very into tanning, and he's got this very, he's like a certain president, yeah. Uh, but it's like they're in this. He's in his home world. He's just like, oh no, it's it's an, it's an honorific, and it, it's just like, um, yeah. But but I've never met met, met Snyder. I from what I hear, because we have. Um, I know people who've worked with him in the past, like through uh, through different organizations. I hear he's he's not the nicest person. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, we um, so we, you know, um, I, I love it that you're reaching out to another generation and, and, and giving them a positive way to look forward. And and um, I do hope that someday we can have some kind of we are getting small victories with with not your mascot. Um, I actually was born in Cleveland, Ohio. And, uh, and my parents, when they were young, they started the whole fight against the mascot there when they were in college. Um, and uh, it's, um, you know, and it's great to see them. And I've been traveling with there as a journalist covering the issue and, um, and talking to folks from, um, from Cleveland. And, um, it's, and it's good to see them get rid of Wahoo, although they still are using the term Indians, in which they have this whole tribe thing and all this kind of stuff they've been pushing. And it's ironic because, of course, Ohio has been depopulated of Native people, you know, um, uh, you know, and uh, they, you know, they drove them out after um, Tecumseh lost at Fallen Timbers, you know. Uh, they drove the Shawnee out and, and the Seneca, uh, the Mingos, and, and, and I, my parents were there because of relocation. The U.S. government, the Con Congress had a law where they were trying to terminate Indian tribes in the 1950s and 60s. Um, and, uh, and then relocate the population to urban centers. And Cleveland was one of the relocation centers that, that people would go to. And so my parents, they, they, you know, so they had, suddenly Cleveland had like 20,000 young Native people. And, uh, and then of course they began trying to get rid of the mascot. It's the first thing they do. And, uh, and it's, uh, but it's, you know, uh, you know, but we're still so invisible. You know, I, it's just really, I mean, I go there and people say, you know, you're the first Indian person I've ever met. And you just don't know how discouraging that is, you know. And, um, and so it's, um, it's still a huge battle. I mean, and, and I have to say, you know, when we were doing the whole Not Your Mascot thing in 2014, we actually didn't get a lot of headway even talking to fans or to, um, or, you know, trying to educate. Um, the way we got a lot of headway was actually um, putting putting uh, news pieces pieces in the news about Dan Snyder and the ridiculous things he was doing trying to protect the mascot on reservations. And uh, by making him look ridiculous, making the issue being about a billionaire and his, his insanity, we were actually making headway. 
And then I, then I think he started by listening to his PR people and stopped providing us with stuff. But, um, but that was actually way more effective. It was weird, you know, but it says something about this country. Yeah, I, I think sometimes just uh, racism as a structure is so complex that there are very many surprising ways in which we, we kind of deconstruct it, fight it, challenge it. And, and that's why I, I, I'm like, I'm all for like trying many, many different legal strategies and realizing that sometimes they're just, we're going to be different in terms of how we approach things. Uh, sometimes it's comedy and oftentimes it actually is these days. Um, sometimes it's satire and sometimes it is, it is marching in the streets, but ultimately, I gotta say, it's it's getting involved with your communities, connecting with organizations, voting, like getting getting them actually organized. Yeah. But but what would you say to Dan Snyder if he could, you know, I mean, he was so obnoxious of trying to kind of own your your, your victory, you know? I, you know? I'm not I'm not quite sure. I I, I um I don't know if there's any like one particular thing I would say. I would probably just like. Uh, I, you know, I would have a million questions, like, you know, like, what, what's his story? Like, what, is, there, is there some kind of story of pain of a, that's driving that ignorance, that, that hate? Um, so I'm not quite sure. I, I would love to see you write an open letter to him. And we, we, I bet the Game Country today would publish it. And because uh, they're like, hey, what's your deal, guy? You know, and <laughs> this is what this victory is really about, you know? Yeah. If he wants to, like, you know, donate some money to us, that's cool, but <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I, I'm definitely up for it. Yeah, yeah, I think it's, yeah, I, I, I really, I was, you know, like I said, I was really excited that she won. Once I understood the, um, the issue from your perspective and from the larger context, I was really, really excited, so, and, um, but, um, yeah, I think. Thank you. Um, let's see, yeah, I guess, we should probably have some time for if if anyone has like any questions, or we can. Yeah. I was curious in your book you wrote the last one. Let's see. It could be a badass reference to our looking at the worst, the slams. Mm -hmm. A badass reference to our own perspective or a slam on life, as well as our journey to unpack these false stereotypes of people of color. It was a way to pay homage to the work of activists who reappropriate words and imagery for self-empowerment and join a larger movement. The bullying I experienced as a kid hadn't really gone away. Um, I was moved the other day listening to your interview on NPR. I called up my daughter, who is a Asian American, Korean. She's gone back to Korea, and at the end of this month is re-getting getting her Korean citizenship back after adopted over here. But she had that experience. She And I didn't realize it growing up in McMinnville, Oregon. She was a chink all her life. You can tell she finally came home one day and said, I'm tired of it, Dad. I'm not a chink, I'm a gook. I need to get their words right. No, because the word hanguk is what a Korean calls himself. Yeah, gook is just a, a Korean, Korean word. word for country. And so she stopped a lot of it, but I was very interested. When you talk about reappropriating words, what, is, what does that mean? Because I know what happened with my daughter. She didn't know what to say when she said, call me the right one. Yeah, I, um, I mean, I've had a very similar story of uh, people calling me a chap and a kook, and I was like, I'm a chink. Like, <laughs> you know, you're so stupid, you can't be racist properly. <laughs> so I, I can definitely relate to that experience. I, I, I think, you know, there's power in claiming my identity. There's power in saying you don't get to define who I am. Like I get to choose those words. And like while not everyone might agree with this idea of reappropriation, because they're they're confused that words and the meanings of them might change, there's no doubt that there's a shift in power from the dominant group to those who, who are reappropriating these terms. Because all of a sudden people have to check in and, and say, like, well, is it okay if I use this word? Is it is it okay if I sing to the lyrics of Kendrick Lamar? Like you know what I mean? Like, you gotta check in and, and, and see, like, what is appropriate for you to do or not. And people are not used to that. And that's why it's so powerful, because it's disruptive. And, uh, you know, every, every single study ever done on reappropriation affirms that there's this shift in power. Even when people don't believe in reappropriation and they start using the words, it, it, there's a, a sense of a, a psychological and emotional shift in terms of, like, their the relationship to their own identity. 
Seems like it makes a more dynamic, exciting society. Yeah, it's like, I, I believe it's a tool for social change, but it's also like poetry in, in action. And, and I think as a, as a country, there's ways in which we're really unique and lucky to have so many diverse, you know, stories. I mean, there's, I don't know that there are any, any other countries in the world that have so many stories, and yet we get to see so few of them, you know, on television or, you know, and, um, and we have an embarrassment of riches. I just wish we could, I mean, I think the idea of us actually checking in with each other means that we will have a more enriching experience as human beings. Yeah, certainly. It, it makes art a lot better. So I would also have a million questions for you if I had a couple hours. I've been following this for a very, very long time. And um, I want to say just a comment. I love that you guys are together because in the beginning, from a legal perspective, thinking about these two situations, um, it, was a, it was a big concern. And, and seeing the empathy and listening to each other is something that our society needs so much. I feel very inspired by that. But um, just as a question for you, um, listening to you explain the origins of the name and why you wanted to name your band that, I'm wondering when that evolved for you. Because I can't imagine when you were sitting in that diner, you were like, I'm going to be called this Lance, and I'm going to have the Supreme Court case. Or, <laughs> like, when they start, you know, when they declined your, 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 your request, like, how did you evolve this? And you, did you have people in your band say, I don't want to go in for this fight, let's change our name? It was a long fight. Yeah, it definitely was a long fight. And, oh, and to be clear, that, that scene in the musical, that didn't actually happen. Because <laughs> so, uh, I was living in Portland and my parents had already sold their restaurant. So if you already have it actually happened, it's in the book. Um, I, I would say my, my relationship to, to the word the slants uh, or the name and even to this idea of reappropriation has certainly evolved over, over time. Because I, I did not imagine this being like a, an issue. In fact, when I when I called it the slants, when I was like, oh, it's going to be our perspective, our slant on life, um, I didn't feel like that it was like this uh, offensive racial slur. I thought I had already seen all these Asian Americans using the term in this reappropriated way, so I thought we were just falling in line with it, and we had not received a single complaint about about the name and all the work that we were doing, and we were working with um, community organizations in 34 states not a single complaint until we applied for the trademark. Then all of a sudden the trademark office is like, well, UrbanDictionary.com says it's offensive. <laughs> and I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. Um, and that's, I think, like for me it was like, oh, well, it's about the principle. Like how, how can they tell me that their quick internet search on a wiki joke website, how, how can they say that matters more than the opinion of the actual community itself? Uh, and, and I think that kind of solidified my belief in this idea. Um, but, you know, it, it's funny, like, um, a week and a half ago, I was doing an interview with the Willamette Week before doing this event, and the guy that was asking me a question, like, if you, if you go back and do it, like, know, knowing what you know now, if you went back, would you do it all over again? And I was like, well, if I'm to be honest, like, if someone were to tell me like you're gonna pretty much go bankrupt, lose every original band member you have, and most of your close personal friends as a result of this, uh, and they told me that in 2006 when I started the band, I'm like, I don't think I would have done it because I wasn't who I am today back then. I wasn't ready for that yet. But a lot of life's journeys, a lot of those big challenges aren't like dealt with all at once. They're dealt with in little steps. Like you kind of move the needle a little bit more and more. Um, you start realizing like the impact a little bit more. So, I you know I to, to kind of if I were to go back, I, I don't know if I would do it again. But but it definitely kind of evolved year by year. The the more I saw how the law was impacting people, the more I saw how the name was meaningful for people like kids in my community who had been bullied and harassed. The more I realized we needed to continue forward. Uh, yeah, so t tomorrow night is our is our final concert uh, as a band, um, and we're doing that so we can actually focus our efforts on a new nonprofit that we started, uh, the Slants Foundation. And so now I, I want to use the kind of capacity and resources that we normally would use for a touring rock band to provide scholarships and grants and mentoring to 
artists of color who want to incorporate activism into their work, like uh, people who are doing unconventional things. Um, that takes a lot of lifting. And so uh, that, that's kind of what I'm using all my capacity for after, after tomorrow. So it's, it's also like, I've been doing like the slants for 13 years. So I'm like, it's, it's like a teenager now. It's ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's kind of this bittersweet relationship that I have with it. But, um, but I, you know, if, if, if we can make our future releases about those other artists, if we can empower another generation, then, then I'm all for it. Like, the, the, I think that's, that's the future uh, because I, I don't want to be like uh, on stage forever. I want to let other people take that stage. Uh, on Saturday on cable radio, I heard a live band from the studio called the Gringo Mariachis. And they really are bicultural. And they're not allowed to put that name on Facebook. And I just hope that somehow they connect with you guys. Sure. At least <laughs> learn from your experience. And that is just so wrong. You can't look them up on Facebook. Yeah, I, I, you know, it's funny because like Facebook originally flagged um, flagged our band name at one point, but they allowed another page called um, The Slants Eat Dogs um, and, and thought that was acceptable. And so uh, we, we had some words with them. <laughs> Ultimately, we prevailed on that one. But, but yeah, hopefully they, they can have that, they can appeal that decision. Do you have a question? There's more of Why 
Tennessee. <laughs> Portland is not that affordable anymore, you know? Uh, I, was, I was getting burnt out. I mean, I was serving on 11 boards when, uh, on my final year in Portland, and um, I just needed a change. I also got, got married, and my, and my partner and I, it was like, let's go on an adventure. Let's just randomly pick a place and start and join a new community. And I highly recommend this. I think more of us should vote for like move to swing states to help balance things out a bit. So you're welcome. But, you know, I, I like it. It's way more affordable, but the humidity is terrible. Yeah. <laughs> See, I thought you chose it because it was. Mem Are you in Memphis? Uh, I'm in Nashville. Oh, Nashville, because the music, I guess, I thought more like you're going to some kind of roots type of thing. Or... I, no, it was just like, oh, it seems like a cool place to live. And so, yeah. What's that? It, it's great. It, it's weird being in like the bachelor, bachelorette party of the like capital of the world, but uh, aside from, I mean, it's it's like it parallels Portland. We have metal taverns too. Um, like aside from that, it, it, it's it's actually quite nice, especially because now like um, I have space, which is new. Um, like some of our neighbors have cows and horses, and it's like when I go past them. It's so calming. Like I actually have a backyard, and it's up against a forest, and it's so soothing and nice. And uh, so it's I, you know, quite happy there. You could have come to Tomah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you know, we, I think we we just wanted to travel a bit and, and change change it up. But who knows? Uh, I guess we're going to do one more question and then there's going to be a signing over there. And please support your local bookstore. There's awesome books over here. <laughs> and get a free seat. <laughs> yeah. So, any other questions? Yeah. account rather than to end up being one of the people in, in those positions. But, but I really, really am grateful for those who choose to go to law school who have this mindset of wanting to ch challenge and change the system. I just uh, The reason why I go to law schools and speak is to remind those students, don't be changed by the system. Don't fall in and think like, this is all that is possible. And I say, you know, whenever they ask me, like, how do you, how do you want a Supreme Court case, I always tell them it's easy. All you have to do is stop thinking like an attorney. Just <laughs> think like an artist instead, because artists and activists, we don't think about what's possible. We think about the world that we want to see, and then we work out the steps to get there. No matter how tough that might be, that's what you ought to do. And, and if you're going to law, like, kudos. Like, I applaud you for it. But like, remember, like, don't always allow yourself to be defined by those constructs. Be that artist instead. Thank you so much for being here.